if I were the uh, Chinese central government sitting there listening to experts, uh, I would have said, yes, that's right, and we did it right. So in, in, in China, for example, the imprisonment rate has always been very low. Um, for a country of 1.4 billion people, the imprisonment rate has never been more than uh, 2 million people in, 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 the, in the country, include, including all sorts of uh, uh, short uh, non-term uh, detention. For in, 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 indeed, in Chinese criminal law, you can never sentence a person for more than 15 years for a single offense, uh, unless it's not for all of this kind of for this in another matter. So, um, I think China learned the lesson in the late 1970s. Uh, when China started the open, uh, the open door policy to reform, they suddenly they realized they were keeping lots of aging prisoners whom they have had imprisoned since the 50s. They never released anyone in the 50s, 60s, 70s until the reform. All of a sudden, they have to support the, the, the very old uh, uh, prisoners, those political offenders. Then they made a decision in the early 80s, let's just shorten the, the term of imprisonment. Uh, we could use death penalty as the alternative, but if you simply want to imprison a person, then better just 15 years in any event, not more than 20 years. So that has been somehow the, the, the uh, practice. So that is the first lesson. The second one is the short person uh, to shorter term, right? Uh, uh, a week, two days, three days. That's quite common. Uh, the police power, um, not under anybody's control. Uh, so you could simply detain a person up to say 15 days. It's quite routine uh, practice in, in Chinese cities. Um, centrality of the police, and that is the heart and the soul of the Chinese social order. Of course, uh, we get into the difficulties you, you mentioned briefly. But what's the differences of having the police at the center stage and a police state? Of course, China is a police state. <coughs> fundamental aspect. It's the one party state under the Communist Party rule. Um, so that's the first thing I want to mention is the political system of China which distinguishes China from the rest of the world. If you really count after the collapse of uh, the former USSR, there are only like Vietnam, North Korea and Cuba, Cuba and then of course China uh, continue to be the, the communist led one party state. Uh, so that uh, defines, shapes the penal politics in China in a fundamental way. Second, I think is an important issue, uh, I think equally important issue is China is a lower middle income country. That is very important. Um, China may make lots of claim about how successful it has been in its economy, but the brutal fact is China is a very poor country. Uh, the, the half of the people living in the countryside, right? uh, that, that, that is the huge change in the demography in China since two years ago. So those are the two issues, two issues I want to mention at the mid, uh, very beginning. Um, what to say about the penal policies? Uh, um, there are three things I want to say. First, um, China doesn't have an autonomous legal system which could make penal policies on its own according to a certain professional standard. Um, so the, the penal policy is embedded and is an integral part of larger political, social, economic policy. So we don't really talk about penal policy as such. Right? It's always part of a larger policy. That probably is a good thing according uh, to what has been said so far. Uh, uh, second, there's the death of research in China. Not only the English literature, or just in Chinese literature. There's not a, a good research culture. There, there's a, actually a distrust of academic research to inform policy decisions. Um, major decisions would have to be endorsed, approved by top Communist Party leaders. 
they normally don't know that much about any particular policy. So the language you put to them have to be very simple, otherwise you don't get endorsement. That partly explains, for example, it's very easy to understand Chinese law because they have to understand it first. China never have a so it's a sophisticated banking insolvency. The law would normally be drafted in very general language. But the main reason is someone else will have to import, uh, endorse that. And that somebody has no knowledge in banking securities or in criminal justice matters. So, so, uh, uh, so that I think is an is issue. There's a lack of research. So decisions will be made on uh, political experiences. Oh, lots of intuition, right? I think it is right. We just do it, we try, it, and then we formulate, uh, uh, cor correct the errors. And then finally, of course, penal decisions are made according to the overall political necessity. Right? That, that is, is very certain uh, in, the, in the Chinese case. But the Chinese state has the incentive to reduce violence and maintain order. Um, being a one-party state, uh, uh, by definition, is, is a demo democratic uh, deficit. There's a, a, a democracy deficit in, in the Chinese political system, so the party state would have to uh, seek a performance uh, for public support. Um, in, in terms of a performance, we normally look at two indicators. One, of course, is the GDP. That is, that's why the, the government has been, uh, in a way, very crazy about growth. Did that support the regime's legitimacy? Another one is equally important is, is social order. So there are, there are two Chinese miracles, so to speak, quote unquote. One is the economic miracle, which people have been talking about and how successful the Chinese economy has been in the past 30 years. But a, a less well-known miracle, if you want, if I may use the term, is a social miracle uh, in terms of a stability. You may, not have, you may talk about the state violence a lot, right? Uh, so the government uh, is a police brutality, abuse of power, uh, but then in terms of the ordinary social order, the uh, interpersonal violence and the, uh, the, uh, the general crime rate, the government has been very effective uh, um, in, in keeping the Chinese streets relatively safe in order to uh, um, uh, uh, regain the public trust and, and the legitimacy. So those are the, 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 the issues. So how successful? We don't know anything about actually statistics. Uh, the one of the reasons I don't have those colorful presentation or part of reasons I don't know how to do it. Another uh, important reason is actually you don't have anything. Right? Most of the statistics in China are classified and officially say those are state secrets. Um, people get into trouble with law if you ask too many questions, if you write things in foreign, speak in foreign like, like that, like that's kind of figure, for example, we'll never know. Right. It's basically it's a top state secret. Um, but occasionally, when the state wants people to know how successful they are, they, they, they need something. Of course, we don't know how valid it is. Uh, for example, in two, uh, 2006, the, the report is China had about uh, uh, 30,000 homicides, 70% of which were, were murder. Right. Um, in 2011, uh, the, the Ministry of Public Security uh, reported in a press conference saying that Chinese uh, homicide rate is under 1% per 100,000 people, which is lower than the vast majority of the countries. So that would essentially make China one of the safest country on earth. We in Hong Kong will sometimes laugh at those figures because back that uh, uh, percentage, mainland is much, much safer than Hong Kong is. But of course, people know if you need, they know it's not the case. But somehow, there's no, there are lots of critical comments, questioning about the, the accuracy of those figures, but then no, nobody has been able to produce some alternative, say local figures, uh, regional figures, 
so those are the only figures that we can go by to indicate the claim <laughs> that is being made by the state as to how effective uh, 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 they are. So now the question is, if it is successful in reducing violence, so how uh, it has done that? Uh, seeing from the state perspective, how do they say uh, how and why we have achieved, achieved the, the, uh, the, the results? But basically, is prevention. The Chinese, the, the heart of the Chinese criminology is to prevent things from, uh, from the very beginning so that it will never happen, so we don't have to worry about that. So the different instrument designed to, to provide negative and positive incentives to uh, um, uh, t take him, say, uh, uh, murder, for example. Uh, uh, for 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 the for the state, uh, murder. Uh, Ten percent of the murder, according to the, the the Supreme Court of China, come out of uh, the family disputes. Right? That is a huge percentage. Uh, there is an unspecified majority of the murder in China. Uh, uh, took place among relatives, neighbors, friends, or otherwise uh, acquaintances. Uh, they, they promote this idea to send out a message that because murder takes place out of, because of the escalation of uh, disputes among people who know each other, uh, they come out of uh, ongoing normal relations you could intervene earlier. Right? If you have enough manpower, if you have a good organization, if you have uh, uh, enough organization, you could stop the majority of the murders from happening, even if the murder rate is very low already. So what they did is many things is one, for example, is to organize a very uh, sophisticated national-wide network uh, to stop disputes. Right? Uh, most of the government in the past 15 years, uh, local government officials have been given the responsibility of, of stopping local disputes. So they will be penalized if a dispute uh, is escalated into violence, especially fatal violence, or even the disputes uh, went out of jurisdiction to other authorities. So basically, it's, it's not only to, to, to resolve disputes, but also to suppress disputes. So basically, nobody should be fine. So uh, the underlining uh, the, the argument is dispute is a bad thing. Right? Uh, in a normal society, people should be very happy. There should be harmonious, harmonious social relations, and uh, uh, something wrong must have happened in the process. Therefore, you have the disputes. So that is the, 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 the government has invested a, the, a huge control network. Right? Uh, the domestic security spending is more than Chinese defense uh, in the past five to eight years. So they, they have enough money to spend on, 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 on domestic security to stop the escalation uh, of, of conflict. <coughs> Uh, so that is the, the, one type of the intervention. The second type, I think, uh, probably uh, can be broadly defined as intervention. Probably is the, I call it the post-event intervention. Uh, one example, uh, the, the Chinese police impose a rule among all the police in China is you must clear every homicide case. So whenever there is a uh, dead body, if it is a homicide, then you must find out who killed that person. Right? So they write the police uh, every year, each province. The, the province will write the city, the city will rank different stations. So whenever there is a murder, you must find out who killed this person. Otherwise, somebody will, will be responsible for that. Uh, they would say sometimes that what we say is 100%, we don't mean 100%, 80% would do. Right? Um, of course, that has led to all sorts of uh, distortion, fabrication, redefinition, um, in order to satisfy the, the, the culture requirement. But at the same time, if you talk with the police, think it had also had a very positive impact. Uh, when you 
force the police to solve all those violence, the, the fatal violence. It has the cascade impact on, say, robbery, on uh, um, uh, rape, and other type of interpersonal violence. So the, the, the overall assessment of the police, that, that policy was imposed on the police in uh, 2004, and I think it's still ongoing. So the, the, the basic message is it, it's critical, but not uh, positive. It would force the police to take violence extremely serious. That probably contribute a lot to what the police are doing on the streets and explains uh, um, the, uh, uh, the order in, in, the, in the Chinese uh, society. Um, the third example about prevention, which I think is the most important one, it is the gated community uh, as it's sort of a geographic design. Um, anyone who, who visit China would probably notice the lots of uh, walls and the gate community. If you are if you're not a member of that community, you are not allowed to get in. Residential community, workplace, uh, uh, university, I think every Chinese institution is like King's College. You will be two person at the gate to check your ID before you are allowed to get into that place. Right? Um, it has declined in the past 30 years because of the market reform, but one thing which is still resilient is the institutionalization of uh, the workers, the migrant workers. Migrant workers now, uh, migrant workers are the peasants who move to the city to work. Uh, because the Chinese law doesn't allow them to stay in the city. They are always temporary workers. Right? That is the internal apartheid that China has been maintaining now until now. So since the early 90s, when China started the market e economy reform, uh, the daily count is between like uh, 100 million and uh, 150 million workers are working in different parts of China. Those are the young men and the women, they, what they, is called the able-bodied person who leave the countryside to work in the factory. But upon arrival in the cities, they quickly and quietly disappeared in the factories because they live in where they work. So basically you have the situation of 24-7. They're all in the factory working hard, right? Uh, the only time you, you basically see them is occasionally in good factories. You have one day break once every two weeks. The, the, the majority of them, you don't see them until the days before Chinese New Year. They will be gathered in the train station and went back home. After three weeks, they come back in the train station and then quickly they disappear in the factories. So imagine that force, 150 million young people. Right? Otherwise, if you think about who are the people, who are, we'll talk about the age, right? the uh, 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 potency of, of the age group. They, those are the, the, the 20s, 30s, early 40s. Those are the people. And they, they, they basically leave their family at home. Right, they came to the city alone to work, but then they are somehow incarcerated or institutionalized in the, in the factories. So the law and the order on some Chinese street, and, and the general the prosperity of the Chinese economy now, have a lot to do with the suffering and the control, discipline of that 100 million Chinese. Now, the challenge. There are lots of challenge. Of course, you, you have those intervention program is possible because you are now police power. The Chinese police as an institution is probably one of the most powerful uh, uh, um, uh, on earth in terms of the power to detain a person for questioning, in terms of the power to incarcerate a person, uh, in, in terms of impose what is called the administrative penalties without proper judicial review. It's very quick and dirty and, and, and get things done very quickly. Right? Can you maintain that 
when you uh, uh, advocate for rule of law, good governance, uh, police power is under challenge increasingly. People that talk about rule of judicial review, the courts, lawyers, uh, and, and generally human rights. So that is one fundamental challenge. So there is the pushback against the centrality of police, the pushback against police uh, state in China in a very serious way, from within the state, from outside the state. And the second is the, the impossibility to, to continue the institutionalization of the 100 million migrant workers uh, due to the generation change. Right? The, the, the migrant workers who entered the city in the 80s, now entering retirement age, their children are now replacing them. There are lots of cases the families, uh, father, son, mother, daughter, working in the same factory. But then you could see the clear differences in terms of, of the attitudes. It's just simply impossible for the management, for the capital, for the state to continue to control the discipline of the workers in the same way as they did to their parents. So now that's the challenge. The question uh, I was asked is, so is it possible to, for China to reduce further uh, uh, violence. Um, um, my answer probably is, is extremely difficult. It's very, extremely difficult to even maintain the current level of, uh, of violence uh, in China because that is achieved at a huge political, economic, and human cost. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kualin, Professor, very much for your talk. And after all, from what I hear, and I wonder if it's just an absence of statistics at all, or just an absence of sharing them with academics or with uh, other communities or out in the open. So my question is, if after all, the wall did not come down in that sense, uh, with the data, I would imagine, for example, the road safety in China, they are very well organized. They are very procedural for uh, public transportation, how you stand in line in the subway, how, how you move around, everything seems to be rules. And I cannot imagine that there would be no official statistics, no baseline measurement, no indicators or time trends. Uh, maybe are they existing somewhere? Somebody is looking at those indicators and uh, not reporting them, in a sense, out to the public, but they do use statistics to design policies, or? Right. Um, yes, um, there are public record data on, say, um, the death rate of um, coma in China. We know pretty well how many people die uh, underground each year. We, they are, uh, very good data on road traffic death rate, yes, um, it's public. The, the only thing missing is anything related to crime. Uh, yes, there are a survey. Uh, there are internal survey about uh, public opinion, uh, victimization type of survey run by the, uh, the National Statistics uh, Bureau. They have, for example, we know the, 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 the government know how many people they execute a year. But it's there, we know how many people know this figure, but uh, honestly, I know the figure, it's simply I cannot talk about the figure. Um, we, we don't know really that so well. We know the rates, for example, homicide rates. We, we know roughly, yes, they are, I, they are public, they are data for public consumption. The difficulties with crime data is there are different sets of data. You're not quite sure which one you can trust. There are, there are data for internal reference, <coughs> for decision making. There are data when they uh, have a press conference. Right? There are data when they do promotion. 
things don't add up. But yes, you're right. There are there are good data there. Um, how accurate it is, I mean, I have to say, is is really a big question mark, because the incentives. If you report a higher rate of murder in your city, you are inviting punishment. Actually, for you are the police chief, for example, the burden is on you to prove that in the past two years I have improved the social order in my city. One key component of that index is homicide rate. So some of the, the incentive structure in the system works against any uh, genuine reporting mm -hmm. of those data. For the local, so that's, that's why I think local data will be much more accurate than the central data. Because the central data are they gather from provinces, from the cities. Right? At each level, you would add certain water into the, or take away some water from, from the statistics, right? Because that is the incentives. Right? Whether they know or not, I mean, there was, for example, uh, there's another joke, uh, a police chief have a conference, right? Uh, you have the ministers sit on the central table and everybody will say, last year we achieved Canadian rate for theft more than 60%, right? And the minister immediately said, that's nonsense, I don't believe it, right? But then what do you do? Of course, the province would have to report, because that is the report he did made for the provincial authorities, right? You have to be consistent. Uh, so, so it's very difficult to say where the true data are on crime in China. My bet is, if you really want to understand the, uh, the, the, the crime, you have to go to at least the city level to get the real data. I was reminded of what somebody earlier quoted was to say that it's very difficult to have evidence-based policy if you don't have the evidence. So that sounds like a, like a, a, a challenge. If I could maybe just abuse my position here, I, 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 I think I heard you saying that you, you know the figures in terms of state executions, which I would very much have been interested to know. Um, but but if, if I may ask, if it is true, as it's sometimes reported, that it may be down from 3,000 to 1,500 or so, whatever the figure is, um, do you perhaps have a sense of, of why is there that decline in the in the uh, in actual executions? Is it and and, and, and of course the, the, the reduction of the number of crimes of 13 or so uh, for which the death penalty may be imposed, and then the centralisation of the final decision. What, what are the drivers of that of that change? The, the driver of, is really the Supreme People's the court decision to reduce uh, whatever the motivation is, uh, international humiliation. Um, all is bad politics. Um, there was a big debate in China whether China um, is creating its own political risk by killing too many people. Right? I mean, you do it easy <coughs> math. China has uh, um, about 5,000 county level unit. There will be a court in a county, right? If each county kills one person per year, that is very normal in the old days, say five years ago, meaning China kills 5,000 per year at a minimum. Right? That's quite easy to do. The motivation is hard to say, but the, the, what happened is, is not really the uh, uh, um, um, reducing the number of capital offenses. Those 13 offenses have almost never been used anyway. The top offense, uh, capital offense in China is first uh, murder, second drug trafficking, right? and then other violent offenses, those are top, top three. Um, drug trafficking, the state is ruthless. Uh, basically, is if you traffic more than a certain amount, depends on where you are, it's almost, almost mandatory death penalty with immediate execution. Right? Um, um, homicide, um, murder, now, that's the, the cases where they are doing lots of work. If uh, the murder takes place between, say, among family members, among people who know each other, they have some ongoing relations, the policy is against death penalty. 
unless there's the catch, unless the victim family strongly demand the death penalty. So the, the, the court would have to do lots of uh, mediation work, right, persuasion of the victim's family not to press the demand. Um, so that, that is the area where China is able to reduce death penalty, not to execute a person who <coughs> kill out of passion, for example, who kill because, you know, let's say, so the typical the Chinese uh, now is uh, a battered woman syndrome has arrived in China, right? The battered woman who abused her for years and all of a sudden they kill. Should you sentence that person to death? Traditionally, yes, but now, as a matter of rule, you don't sentence them to death. So, so that is probably is the, the, the very narrow, but it's a very significant area in which the, the Chinese court is able to reduce uh, death penalty.